Embercleave, and you think, ah, oh, okay, red green beatdown. Then there's Goldspan Dragon and Valky, a bunch of Asika's chariots. It just turns out the adventures package that both of these decks are playing is so good at both beating the opponent down, putting them under pressure, but also prolonging the game that. Well, these decks have to make a lot of good plans for the late game because they expect these games to go long, especially in the mirror, which is going to be the most common matchup. Yeah, you know, the other card that really stood out to me from yesterday was Magda Brazen Outlaw. And strangely enough, it was the activated ability of sacrificing five treasures. There's really good stuff to get. And a lot of times the players trade resources off and Magda is one of the cards that's left over. If you can get it tapping you can actually turn it into a very powerful engine to get some of your more powerful stuff on the battlefield. Yeah, uh, I've heard from a, a highly regarded limited podcast that uh, having a two drop that's good early in the game and good late in the game <laughs> is valued. And Magda puts pressure on early, but as you saw, is an engine later in the game. Indeed. All right, well, we're we're underway here, Marty, with just a 1-1 one, one token from a Lovestruck Beast to kick off the festivities. And let's see where he wants to go from here. On the other side, Fire Prophecy at the ready for Sam Pardee. But beyond that, kind of not a whole, whole else going on. So Sam's really going to hope to find something with his Fire Prophecy. He's going to take down just the 1-1 one, one here, discard a land. And there you go, a Love Struck Beast off the top for Pardee. He's got yeah. double Asika's Chariot to follow up after, but for now he can at least cast something. It'll it'll help, and... Uh... Right now, uh, you know, Sam Mulligan and has a kind of clunky draw. He chose to make a 1-1 one, one token instead of casting Lovestruck Beast, which really just shows he's got an eye to the late game because he's just going to not spend those other two mana, but he wants to get that extra value. He wants to get that 1-1 one, one token. Both players are going to play Asika's Chariots here. You're, you're just going to end up with the board being as stalled as you'd expect. And, uh, well, that draw of Shodan of the Scalds, that, that's the card that uh, I could feel Marshall chanting every turn. He just wanted to see it go off last uh, last game. So we'll see if, uh, if it ends up making a pretty big impact here. Yeah, I love that card. Uh, you know, that's the type of card that decks like this don't often get access to, right? Just sort of raw card advantage that it gives you. Uh, and then, of course, the plus one, plus one counters end up being really relevant in creature mirrors like this as well. So really one of the more powerful options out of the two decks, but... As we've said before, and, and we let off with here, the the Monte Quizma's Gruel Adventures deck, it can keep up. It, this is not one of those things where you have just an aggro deck versus a mid-range deck. Uh, they both have the ability to do very powerful things into the late game. And we'll have to see how this goes for Sam. That has to be one of the better draw steps for Pardee, though, right? Off of the mulligan, and, and like you said, a little bit of a clunky start. He doesn't take any damage last turn, and now he finds a showdown. The, the issue for Sam is going to be that pair of uh, Valky, God of Lies, in Mahdi's mm. hand, he he's going to be able to just cast those as Tybalt's. And I don't know if Sam can beat one, much less the second. This is going to be tough for Sam to get out of. Sam's going to trade off Lovestruck Beast here after the Edgewall Innkeeper comes down to enable the attack here for Mahdi's Lovestruck Beast. There's a land and then go, though. So again, Party has to be happy that he hasn't just been run over here. He's still at 18 life. But boy... Those two Valkyries are looming large in hand here for Mati Quizma, and it could get ugly. Yep, and we're going to see the first one hit here. Drawing that land is going to open the door for uh, the Tybalt Cosmic Imposter, which is going to come down, maybe eat that Lovestruck Beast, especially with the second one. You don't even care if Sam has a way to kill it. Tybalt extraordinarily powerful, expensive Planeswalker, but very, very powerful if you can get it onto the battlefield. And that's what we see here. And look at this. Mahdi's going to take the plus line here. He's going for value. He's going to let the board sit as it stands. There is Showdown of the Scalds into another one, also into critically a land here. Bone Crusher Giant, Yespera Sentinel are the other two cards. An attack with Lovestruck Beast against Tabalt can either be chump locked or he could even just absorb the five. The presence of that Bone Crusher, though, is going to dissuade Mahdi from letting Tabalt take five, and uh, he's going to chump block with a cat here. Sam opting to leave a uh, stomp of off Bone Crusher Giant up instead of playing anything else, and d in fact chose not to kill the Innkeeper. Currently, you know, he's made the the call that Mahdi does not have access to any adventure creatures, which is going to work out for now. Rimrock Knight in another land hit off of the Tabalt activation. Tabalt quickly up to nine loyalty. 
I did not like Sam's chances facing down against Tybalt. It's just yeah. massive amount of loyalty, drawing two cards a turn. Mahdi already has flooded the board with uh, Datasika's Chariot. He's got an innkeeper that's going to draw a card off Rimrock Knight if he plays it. Shatter Skull Smashing could even take down the two one ones and make it so Lovestruck Beast could have a problem attacking. There, there's just a lot going on here. Yeah, Mahdi really taking advantage of uh, the mana that he's got here. You know, he's got seven lands on the battlefield, plus he has Spare Sentinel. That put him quite a bit clear of Sam, and Sam has, you know, really found some nice stuff to cast in the interim, thanks to Showdown and to Showdown, plus the other cards. But, boy, as far as massive impact on the board now, Tabalt is uh, is doing his thing. And there's a smashing five damage to the Lovestruck Beast, leaving Sam Party with just the two one ones left over. And it looks like Quisma is uh, content to just pass rather than fire up the chariot there. Oh yeah, de definitely no reason to to get too aggressive here. You've you know you've you've got the Tibolt in play. It's on Sam to to make something happen. Well. Sam uh, fired off Stomp out of the exile zone from Showdown, and he's going to line up the other Showdown of the Scalds. I mean, is there something to be said here for double Showdown to get him back into it, or is it just over? It's not just over, because next turn, the first Showdown's going to, you know, proc its third, its third stage, and then the, the second one is going to move to Chapter 2. And so now, then Sam's going to be in a position where every card he casts gives him two plus one, plus one counters. That's going to end up being a lot of material, and I could see Sam from there, if he has enough creatures in play, just being able to overwhelm Mahdi. I don't think it's going to be easy. I, I would rather be on Mahdi's side of things here, but Showdown of the Scalds is a very powerful combo with itself. It finds more copies, and then it sets these turns up where you cast... I mean, Sam could potentially cast four spells in the same turn, eight plus one plus one counters. Yeah, that that's a lot of extra power and toughness. Yeah, it doesn't even matter what the creatures are. I mean, all of his creatures are small here. Three one ones and a one two, but he's just gonna make it four one ones, and but he's just gonna throw around a bunch of counters. And it looks like he's actually got this one token up to five five, which means he's clean to attack here, even through the chariot. And perhaps force another chump block from Quizma. Yeah, Monty's going to go ahead and block with the cat token, it looks like. Boy, a lot of action, though, for Sam Party. He has a Bone Crusher Giant on an adventure with a uh, double Edgewall Innkeeper on the battlefield as well. Sam's drawing a lot of cards. Against a normal draw from Monty, I mean, this this would be really, really tough for uh, for Monty to win. As is, I mean, I, I think what Tybalt flips next turn is going to be interesting. Because the way Sam's board is distributed, the minus three on Tibble is just not that impressive. You can kill a one-one. It's That's next right. turn when when all the creatures are really going to pop off. Yeah, I wonder if Mati Quizma can get a board state under him that is going to be good against multiple large creatures, because that is what Sam's going to do. He, so, you know, Monty either needs to get rid of the creatures on the other side or have enough on his side to combat it. Bone Crusher was a good flip because it takes out one of the creatures now, probably an innkeeper, just to prevent the card draw on Sam's side, and then uh, also put something onto the board. But Sam is doing a good job of pressuring Mahdi and, and getting things out of the way. I, I actually have grown to love these matchups. We, every game that we've had the chance to watch of a, the Adventures deck against a different Adventures deck has led to some really, really good back and forth. Yeah, these decks are similar enough so that they have to kind of smash a bunch of creatures together, but they're different enough so that their strategies diverge quite a bit, particularly when we get to the mid and late game like we see here. Rimrock yeah, Knight I mean, hitting the, the battlefield, drawing a card. At the end of this, Mahdi only has two blockers. The Rimrock yeah. Knight can't block. Hey, granted, the Rimrock Knight can help crew the chariot, but oh, yeah, Sam drew another fire prophecy. Like... I don't think uh -huh. you know, Sam, Sam's quite to the point where he can just deal 20, but I think he's going to be able to get Tybalt off the board here. Wow. <laughs> Impressive stuff, really. You, you Seriously. Know, you, you're the, the biggest showdown of the Scalds fan, so if this doesn't like you know quench your thirst for a big showdown <laughs> game, I don't know what will. <laughs> no, I'm happy. This is incredible stuff from Sam Pardee. He has two triggers from showdowns here this turn. This is the one window where he gets the double triggers. So he's basically going to want to optimize 
for casting as many spells as Ooh. possible while also getting as many creatures out of the way. And Fire Prophecy is perfect for that. Oh, yeah. He drew a Jasper Sentinel. He traded Asika's Chariot for Jasper Sentinel. Normally on turn seven, that would be a pretty bad deal. On this turn, though, it's kind of what Sam's looking for. That's right. It was a redundant chariot as well. So he figures, well, I can just take advantage of that. And interesting decisions on how he wants to distribute these counters. Can he get enough damage in or force Mati Quizma to either have to give up an important creature like an innkeeper or choose between that and his Debalt? We'll have to find out. Ooh, there's Bone Crusher as well. So Sam is now getting to the, the end game here. He's going to get to cast one more spell this turn after this Jasper Sentinel, so two total. Right. Mm -hmm. So currently he's not going to be able to take down Tybalt thanks to that chariot blocking, but he could put Mahdi in a spot where, let's see, if he gets two, four more plus one, plus one counters, he can put Mahdi in a spot where Mahdi has to chump with chariot or lose Tybalt, I think. Is that is that correct? I guess if he leaves up Stomp as one of those spells... Mahdi blocks the 5-5. Five, five. Yeah, Tybalt goes to 1, but that involves chumping with the Seeker's Chariot. So right. it's gonna, at, at the very least, the Chariot's going to go to the graveyard and the Tybalt's going to take a bunch of damage. It's possible Sam could do better than that, depending on how Mahdi blocks. Wow. Incredible stuff. And it looks like Sam's going to play Fabled Passage off of the, the other showdown here, perhaps signaling that he'd like to get this... Um, Spellbinder into play? Yeah, that's what's going to happen. A big reason to do that, by the way, is that uh, he is going to lose access to that Spellbinder if he doesn't play it this turn. It's off that right. uh, second showdown. <laughs> it's actually going to be pretty funny taking the other Tybalt out. Tybalt, as powerful as it is, and as, as much as it looked like it was going to dominate the game, when you don't have a good board position, it's just not going to do that much. And at this point, the Chariot has to chump to keep Tybalt alive. Tybalt drops to three. Mahdi's then going to get you know get to untap with Tybalt and a ton of mana. But Sam's got an overwhelming board position. And you remember that showdown? It's going to stick around one more turn, or at least the effect is. The showdown's going to go away, and you're going to get one more turn of plus one, plus one counters. Yeah, and that could be huge because we see Stomp plus Bone Crusher plus another Bone Crusher. And that's going to, yeah, look at this. In fact, Tabalt is going to take down the Innkeeper here. Mati Quizma is seeing the writing on the wall. Does he have the nine mana to actually cast Falky? He's one short, right? Well, he he doesn't have to actually have to go for it this turn. Drawing Lovestruck Beast was a, was a great draw because now he gets to play the Innkeeper because Tybalt, you know, lets you play whatever it killed and then draw a card off of uh, Lovestruck Beast after making uh, probably a Heart's Desire token. Thanks to the Tybalt Emblem as well, he can, like, cast that Innkeeper without using green mana. So it's going to work out well. The way this matchup seems to play out is whenever someone's behind, but then they get to take their turn, they usually get to put a bunch of stuff out and maybe swing the matchup back the other way. So this yeah. is Mahdi's time to shine, and we'll see how much he can build up. Yeah, it really comes down to who can break serve first, right? Who can be the one to uh, force the other person to have a, an unimpressive turn? Wow, a Crow and War off the top here for Sam Bardi. The Crow and War doesn't actually even do anything here. Nothing? No, it's it's what? amazing. It's, it's I was going to say, wait a deck. second. It's awesome here. <laughs> you just had her so excited. Don't do that to me. <laughs> my, my natural inclination is to, is to dial you back. No, uh, yeah. <laughs> a Crow and War is going to take the Lovestruck Feast here, and that's going to leave Sam in really good position because he's going to get to, you know, continue getting counters off Showdown. And Elite Spellbinder goes from zero to hero once it can get get past the mighty Jasper Sentinel, which yeah, it now right. can. <laughs> Wow. What a, what a sequence of four mana enchantments there for Sam Pardee, stringing together a pair of showdowns into the Akroan War and putting himself in an incredible position in a game that looked like he was going to lose. I mean, he had a mulligan and kind of a clunky opener. He faced down a Valky, or I should say a Tab. And uh, he's just been able to kind of ride the wave of the advantage plus and plus one plus one counters from the double showdown. Now it'll be interesting to see if Sam uses Bone Crusher right now to take out that uh, innkeeper or just kind of holds it. He, he he once again could be, you know, thinking that uh, Mahdi doesn't have too many adventure creatures kind of left in the tank. And yeah, it doesn't look like Mahdi's going to play an adventure creature this turn either. What's the advantage of holding it? More flexibility. It's possible that you want to kill something more desirable like a Magda, maybe tick down uh, or hit Vault, uh, Tybalt's loyalty a little bit. 
mm-hmm. or end up in a spot where if Mahdi doesn't know it's coming, currently he, he doesn't he doesn't see the bone crusher in hand, he he might make a line where killing a Jasperison at the end of turn can get that elite spellbinder through. There's a lot of different options because without adventure creatures, I mean Innkeeper is just a one one. Right. Quizma with an interesting decision here on triple land plus another one from a prior Tibalt, but he does have Magda or Valky. I, I do want to point out that there was a sequence of turns where Mati Quizma used Tibalt's plus two and hit like between his draw step and those two cards, two land out of the three cards he saw every turn for like two yes. or three turns. So cool. even though Sam is pulling ahead now, I think a lot of times if that same sequence happened, Mahdi would be the one winning. It just turns out the cards didn't break in, in his favor. Yeah. Yeah, he's supposed to have a bunch of spells left over here, and uh, that is not how it played out for Monty this time around. It does look like he's going to spend his mana for the turn on Tabalt Cosmic Imposter and try to scrap his way back into this game. He's way behind on board now. And he's going to have to survive in a Crow and War turn you know, on his next turn, all his creatures are going to be forced to attack. So any any damage he takes now is going to be exacerbated by the fact that he's not going to have as many blockers as he'd like two turns from now. Right. You see that flexibility with the stomp here really shining now for Sam Pardee, not panicking and killing the innkeeper, being patient with it, because it really does kind of limit what Quizma can do. It, Quizma doesn't know about it, but, you know, if he decides to minus to Balt, well, he'll just lose it. And there it is. Tabalt minus three on the Bone Crusher. And so one of the things Tabalt that's inter- exposed. interesting about that is because of that Jasper Sentinel, Mahdi does have the ability to, to cast Stomp. But look, keeping Stomp on Sam's side has worked out really well because he's going to kill the Jasper Sentinel here. And now Mahdi, if he wants to cast Stomp this turn, he has to tap not only Sentinel, but also the Rimrock Knight, leaving him with just the Edgewall Innkeeper as a blocker. We finally found the weakness in Jasper Sentinel. <laughs> Sam is also giving up uh, the ability to 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 to, to kind of be flexible there, but I think for good measure. Oh, Showdown yeah. of the scalds off the top for Sam Party. He is running hot today. He's he's had some scalding hot draws. That is for sure. Wow, and he hit another one lander off of it too, which is kind of right where you want to be three spells and a land and the first one is going to be a fire prophecy to kill well he's targeting the last blocker available the edgewall innkeeper can he get lethal here 510 needs a 1-1 i guess he has an innkeeper there oh he's going to get cute here make his layer of the hydra a 1-1 what it looks like it's what looks like what he's doing that will enable the attack from the lustruck beast and that's 16 damage coming across. Oh, there we go, Sam. And he's going to crash in for <laughs> if, 15. If Mahdi hadn't said exactly good game, that. Sam might have killed the Tabalt. <laughs> mm-hmm. But uh, Sam is going to win uh, another amazing adventure mirror in, in game one. Uh, yeah, this matchup really does produce some awesome uh, games. And uh, we're going to see... Now, as we work our way towards the sideboards here, you see for Monty, he's had, he has even more value out of the board, the two times Ox of Agonis, and then the Akron War, which we've seen really kind of dominate the board every time it's come down in the matchup. Both players get to kind of tighten up their decks post-board. Uh, yeah, again, Monty bringing those cards you mentioned in, the, the higher curve, card advantage cards, Burning Hands, Sam also on Burning Hands, and then Draneth Magistrate, uh, a, a pretty heavy hitter when it comes to adventure matchups because it, it basically forces your opponent to cast one half of the adventure creatures and just be unable to get both sides. Right, and that only affects the opponent, right? So Draneth Magistrate's just a card that kind of, another card that needs to be killed at some point if the opponent's really kind of going to do their thing. All right, underway here. Uh, both players kicking off the game the same way with uh, Yespera Sentinel. And taking a look at the opening hands here for our players, is there any red mana in sight here for Sam? Well, he's got that Sentinel if he wants. Uh, okay. So that'll help. It's likely that one of his creatures are, is going to get stomped this turn, and interesting to see which one uh, Mahdi goes after. Sam would actually prefer... The Tangled Florahedron die, I think, given the situation, even though it's a, a sl- the slightly stronger creature in a vacuum. Yeah, he got his wish then. The stomp crushes the Tangled Florahedron, and now 
If Spirit Sentinel stands alone, that's true for Mati Kuzma, at least for the moment. And she's going to settle for Cassian Bone Crusher Giant. And there's another showdown of the Scalds off the top of the library. We're going to see Dranith Magistrate plus a land here. And then is it Fire Prophecy time for the uh, Bone Crusher? I mean, leaving that thing on the battlefield doesn't seem super awesome. Yeah, pretty pretty enticing to do that now because you can also put back if you want one of your uh, other cards to try to hit a land unclear if sam wants to to put back a powerful card here but it's probably the safest play because with showdown of the scalds you really don't want to end up in a position where you're, you're tight on mana because showdown doesn't work all that well under those conditions i see so he's going to take the the non-greedy line there he actually got rid of the acrone war but it paid off he hit craig Cram pathway so now the showdown of the scalds is online here comes Magda Brazen Outlaw for Mati Quizma. In, into a Sika's Chariot, thanks to Ma, the Magda Jaspera Sentinel Mondo combo. Wow, that was actually a really nice turn there. Lots of mana off of just the four lands. And he gets the two, two twos as well. Fable Passage off the top of the library here for Sam. And this seems like a fairly forced play for Sam. You stomp the, the Magda, and then you just cast the Bone Crusher to, to try and trade for the Chariot. You really want to set it up so that you cast Showdown of the Scalds when you're not super far behind, because you, know, you, you generally don't want to cast Card Draw when you're far behind. In fact, it's usually best to cast as one of the last cards in your hand, and Sam's setting up to do that nicely here. He is. He's just got Fabled Passage and Showdown of the Scalds in hand as he passes the turn back to Quizma, who has Asika's Chariot, has an Ox of Agonis, and a backup Chariot as well. So he can feel pretty confident about just throwing this one into the red zone, because even if it trades off, he can just replace it with another Chariot. And that's exactly what he does. It trades off for the Bone Crusher Giant. Chariot is a follow-up play. Another land here for Pardee, but he's going to kick it off with Showdown of the Scalds, the card that uh, got him to victory last game. And this is a much different story. He hits triple land and just an edge wall innkeeper, much worse than we saw in game one. Yeah, this is going to be really tough for Sam because not only is Sam losing to his chariots, Mahdi's last card was Ox of Agonis. <laughs> so, Perfect. Uh, Ooh. Despite the three land draws there, it's still Sam's going to get overrun by the, these uh, cats plus the chariot. And Sam's next turn is going to need to be a really amazing draw to to really have a chance here. By the way, it's just spare a sentinel getting in the red zone as well. Not going to sit at home while everybody else goes off to battle. And down to five goes Sam. He finds a burning hands, but one for one removal at this point is not nearly enough. And Mati Quizma with a clean victory here in game number two. Well played and a really nice curve out from him. You even got to see a little bit of his sideboard plan with the Ox of Agonis, and it was an easy win for him cruising to force the game three. We are going to take a short break, but when we come back, we're going to have game three between Sam Pardee and Matty Quisma. Don't go anywhere. And welcome back. We've got game three in this exciting matchup between Mati Quizma and Sam Pardee. Naya Adventures in the hands of Sam. Mati has brought Gruul Adventures. Again, they have a similar core of creatures, ones that will be you'll be familiar with if you've been watching Standard over the last year and a half or so. But uh, after that, they do take a, a pretty different stance on how they want to handle not only the sideboard, but also the game as it goes into the late game. But I have to say, both of them have very, very potent 
late games. I don't feel like one of them is 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 really lacking over the other. Yeah, they both had just have different options, and but all of them provide a lot of card advantage. Both players on a mulligan here, and good mulligans uh, from from these players. They just making good choices when it comes to to what how greedy to get because. We're, we're going to see both players really try to maximize their chances, and that involves, you know, being disciplined. So not not something you'd always see if you were, you know, just playing on arena, but d- these are the cream of the crop here, and uh, I'm, I'm settled in for stream. an interesting game. Discipline not part <laughs> of the equation for a Luis Scott Vargas stream, I'll say that. Uh, let's see. So Sam Party is going to kick things off with Heart's Desire. And just a mountain for Quizma. So in comes the Heart Desire token. And this is going to allow Sam, after playing his land here, to leave up Fire Prophecy. And I just want to note, Sam put back Edgewall Innkeeper on his Mulligan to Sex. He wow. he, he just respects Maddie's uh, removal spells that much. And Madi put back uh, Magda. So both players just like, I don't want to get bone crushered here. And uh, wow. yeah, pr- pretty strong plays. It's going to work out pretty well. Sam probably looking at that showdown and thinking like, yeah, you know, I don't really need to to, to put my uh, stock in a precarious card advantage posi- uh, engine like Innkeeper when I could just cast Showdown of the Scalds on turn four. That's right. Love Struck Beast is going to hit the battlefield. Now, Mati Quizma did find a target for Stomp, but it was just the 1-1 token that will at least temporarily shut off the Love Struck Beast as there's no more 1-1 tokens around to, uh, to enable it, or 1-1s, I should say. Quizma on the other side of the table. Not a whole lot going on. Going to have to make the classic decision. Do you play the Lovestruck Beast or do you make a token? Sam, I think, made the right choice in round one by by playing the token. And, oh, he's, a, he's also got the Bone Crusher. So he's just going to go ahead and do that. And now's a perfect time to land Shodan of the Scalds and uh, see, see what that flips up. Woo, flipped up a lot of action there. A giant killer of fire prophecy and an Asika's chariot to go with the land. Another kind of perfect balance there. Can he get those cards out of the exile zone quickly enough is really the question. Well, he's going to be able to certainly play the land. And my guess is Asika's chariot plus just face up giant killer. But mm-hmm. we'll, we'll see what Sam ends up wanting to do. The Asika's chariot's just the most powerful of the cards. So pretty hard to turn that down, though. You know, depending on what Madi does, if Madi goes make a token, then play a Lovestruck Beast this turn, which I don't think that's necessarily the play, but if he makes that play, then Sam might just go, you know, Fire Prophecy, the Bone Crusher, chop down the the, the Lovestruck Beast. Right. That would also give him future value from the Giant Killer itself. Yeah, you know, how, how well you use your mana is so critical in these spots. And look at this attack here. The Bone Crusher just slamming into the Lovestruck Beast, and Sam could not block quickly enough. He was all about that block. It is pretty nice to be able to uh, force your opponent into a spot where they have to, to then spend another card here. Right, and that is the case. No way that Quizma can make that attack unless he knows. And look at that. It's Shatter Skull smashing for one not a great turn there for Quizma. Sure, he got the 5-5 five, five off the board, but it cost him dearly his entire turn worth of mana and two cards to do it. So the, the reason that uh, that Mahdi made that play, it might seem kind of odd, is he was looking at the Fire Prophecy and Giant Killer on the other side and maybe wanting to trade off any creatures in play. In fact, he didn't even play Jasper Sentinel or make a 1-1, one, one, so Sam didn't have a target for that Fire Prophecy. I think the issue with that is Sam just makes this play, which is just play Chariot and play a Giant Killer. It's not Sam wasn't particularly put out by the fact that he had no targets for that Fire Prophecy here. I don't even think he wanted to play it to begin with. Yeah, and the downside here is that now you're facing down an Asika's Chariot. I, you know, that's that card's been known to take over the game quite easily. We saw it, in fact, last game on Matty Quizma's side. A pair of Asika's Chariots was really dominant. Here's, by the way, speak of the devil, there's another Asika's Chariot. So both players have them. Now, Sam is exactly where he wants to be. He's got a showdown trigger gonna gonna go off. He's gonna be able to force Madi to to animate the chariot now with this fire prophecy, and then has both burning hands and giant killer at the ready. If Madi doesn't animate the chariot, well, Sam's just gonna attack with his own chariot and make a make a cat copy. So Sam's got board presence and three removal spells and got to untap and just make the first move there. You talked about breaking serve. Well, Madi was Madi kind of gave up that turn where he cast Shatter Skull Smashing to to negate 
Sam's previous turn, which means he just is falling further and further behind as Sam's really making use of this. Yeah, you got to feel for Mariquizma. He took that one turn off, basically, did the best he could to play around what he saw uh, coming from the showdown, but it has not worked out well for him as now he's fallen way behind. <laughs> and Quizma gives us the, the signal. He says, I am dead. This did not work out well. And uh, it looks like he's just kind of buried. He finds a Valky God of Lies off the top of the library, but he won't be able to cast that as Tabalt. And uh, he sees the writing on the wall. Yeah, once you get the the, the Seth Rogen, they're like, mm -mm. <laughs> you know? we're done. Then, <laughs> then, we're done. then I, I, I think I think he's done, and uh, it's it's going to be tough here. Like he's got an Ember Cleave that he's really never going to be in a position to play. Doesn't have enough mana for Tibalt, and can cast a Lovestruck Beast. But Sam's just got removal spell, removal spell plus a Giant Killer in play. So it uh, looks like Sam Pardee is going to be advancing to eight and two and leading the pack here. Maybe tied with one other player, depending on how the other matches went. Yeah, and if if that's the case, that means he's just one win away from advancing to Sunday play. And, uh, you know, putting himself potentially in that top four as well, which is a critical cutoff as well. Of course, your first goal is to make sure that you're playing on Sunday. And here, 12 of the players get to rather than the kind of customary top eight that we're used to. But also, you know, the prize pool is a lot flatter at this event than it normally would be. Where we have, you know, the big prize is number one. There's actually four players at the end of Sunday that are going to get that top prize of qualifying for the World Championship. And especially with the way that the prize pool ended up uh, going for the World Championship this year. I mean, just making it there is a massive jump. Let alone the prestige and everything that comes with playing in, you know, the most important Magic Tournament we have every year. Well, it is flatter in the sense that first through fourth all win the the, the ultimate prize. But you tell fifth place it's, it, that this is a flat prize pool, and they're, they're going to have some words for you. <laughs> well, four, four out of 24 people getting the top prize is – that's a lot. It is. Interesting decision here for Pardee. He's got Layer of the Hydra. Could that be a relevant card this game? He says, yeah, I think it might actually be. Yeah, He gets I, his innkeeper back, and he has a giant killer as well. I think Lair of the Hydra being a zero mana, you know, five, five effectively, like you get to play it this turn, attack with it next turn, better than the, a random card in your deck. I also hmm. don't think there's going to be a next turn. Mahdi's going to chump here, fall to three, and then draw his card and and, re and concede. Yeah, it's an edge wall innkeeper. There really wasn't anything to get him out of this mess. And uh, you got to feel for Mati. This game just has not gone the right way for him. And uh, Sam Pardee says, yeah, you can cleave me on the way out. No problem. And my money gives him the nice. Sam Party agrees because that means he gets to win the match two games to one here. And he's going to improve to eight and two with all the implications that come with it. So really great stuff there from Sam Party as he continues his dominance. Really, he has had, you know, now two great tournament runs. And I'm willing to book this one in that even right now. You know, just getting to this point in the field has already been an awesome tournament for him if he can close out. Strong, he'll find himself in the in the top four. Even if he doesn't close out super strong, he'll probably make it in the top 12. So really great stuff from Sam Pardee uh, and impressive again. And Luis, once again, uh, you were right. The uh, the Naya deck ended up winning there. Yeah, I think that Shodan of the Scalds really kind of showed its stuff there. It helped, you know, the, the combination of two helped Sam win a game where Tibbo was on the board for like four turns. Not a typical thing to happen. And then in game three there, Shodan drew Sam three cards and, and gave him a bunch of plus one, plus one counters. So even though he mulliganed, well, both players did, he was able to out-resource Mahdi very effectively. Yeah, he was, and that was it. Sam Party picks up the win. All right, we are going to take a short break. When we come back, though, we'll have even more standard for you from this round. Don't go anywhere.
And welcome back to coverage here of the Challenger Gauntlet. That's Luis Scott Vargas. I'm Marshall Secliff. Thank you so much for joining us. Not you, Luis. Uh, this round, we've got a little more action to bring you. We've got uh, game two coming in here between two of our competitors. We have Ian Burrell, who's playing Sultai Ultimatum versus Piotr Viktorzak, who's on Naya Winoda. Now, Ian, kind of on a life heater here, got engaged just a few months ago. Piotr just had a child a few months ago. So awesome stuff for these two guys coming into the tournament. And as it stands, Ian's actually up a game here, Luis, but kind of unhappy because he's on a heater. He went 3-0 in historic coming into the round, but isn't happy with his deck choice of Sultai Ultimatum for standard. He's actually the only one that chose it. I think Sultai Ultimatum is a is a bold choice given really Lair of the Hydra and Den of the Bugbear. The 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 two creature lands really punish this deck for trying to tap out and play sweepers. But you know it's still a powerful deck and uh, still w when it gets the right sequence of answers, it it can get the job done. Okay, well let's see if Ian Burrell can uh, finish the job here or if it's going to be Piotr who ends up making the comeback and winning two games in a row. He's going to kick things off. With Selfless Savior, he's on Naya Winota, a deck that's seen a resurgence of late. Winota decks have kind of come and gone over the course of Standard, but it seems to be the flavor of the week again. And hey, there's part of the reason why right there, right, Luis, the uh, Prosperous Innkeeper? Definitely a, a key piece of the puzzle here, trying to you know, get your Winota out on turn three. Drawing it off curve here isn't really what you want, but Elite Spellbinder also happens to be a very effective card against this uh, Sultai deck as well. Ian Burrell's going to make the kind of force play here. He's going to use Heartless Act to kill the Selfless Savior while, while Elite Spellbinder is still on the stack. Of course, you'd much rather kill the Spellbinder, but that's uh, that's the whole point. And uh, Peter's got an interesting choice here. Obviously, it's uh, it's appealing to take the ultimatum because it goes from seven to nine mana. But binding the old gods is also relatively expensive. And if you're trying to uh, finish the game, faster than uh you know turn turn six or seven then maybe just taking the binding and hope hoping you don't they never get to ultimatum could work six mana binding now for ian who looks like he's pondering just going for an omen of the sea main phase he actually drew a triumph for the turn and he's just going to play it and pass the turn back Ooh, there's another spellbinder off top of the library here for Piotr. those things start to get really annoying in multiples as the clock increases dramatically and they can really keep you off of stuff for a long time. At this point, I'd be surprised if you you could turn down taking the ultimatum here, given that you have no targets for uh, Elspeth's Nightmare. So Elite mm -hmm. Spellbinder, you know, what, what are you talking about, Winota deck? This is just an Elite Spellbinder beatdown deck. Yeah, it certainly is. <laughs> it's, got, it's got some kind of weird friends along for the ride. But uh, yeah, if you get to do back-to-back -back Elite Spellbinder, you're going to find yourself in a pretty good position regardless of the rest of the cards in your deck. Ian's shaking his head. Wow, he actually took the nightmare there, Louise. Uh, I am surprised by that play. It's pretty ambitious, and now Ian looked confused too because now Pewter's almost going to get max punished here because the uh, extinction event is going to go ahead and take down those two spellbinders, leaving Ian not that far away from casting this ultimatum given there's no pressure on the board. Right, extinction event critical here. Pewter is going to see his board wiped. And he draws Kenrith the Return King, and he's going to play his Prosperous Innkeeper. He's still a mana off from Kenrith. Oh, yeah, there's Kervik. And now, not only could Ian play this Elspeth's Nightmare anyway, since adding two to a three-cost card isn't, isn't completely out of reach, Kervik can also just take down the Innkeeper and without even doing anything else. Though one advantage to getting the Nightmare going is it's possible, and very likely, that piotr has got a more expensive spell in hand, and that's why he took the Elspeth's Nightmare to protect it. Yeah, it really does feel like there's some pressure here on Ian to get that Elspeth's Nightmare on the battlefield. Because of that, maybe he can nab something before Piotr has the mana to actually cast it. Let's see if he goes for that play. No, he's going to go for the Karavek. And that means that not only a Crone War, but now Vivian Monster's Advocate are both uh, active and available. Same thing with uh, Kar uh, excuse me, Kenrith. It's going to be Vivian here, though, for Piotr. Yeah, that Binding the Old Gods is really going to take care of Vivian nicely. 
if he wants to get greedy, I suppose he could binding the 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 three three beast token while two two with uh, Karavek out and attack moving down to one. But see, that seems like poking the bear there. Yeah, it does. You know how it's always tempting to make those plays uh, when when regarding planeswalkers and <laughs> the times when it doesn't work out, it hurts real bad. Like usually, you end up losing the game. The higher reward play could play be Kenrith, but again, you're kind of banking on Ian not having a sixth land, and that's just not a bet I like to make against the deck that just plays 100 land. Right. Oh, the rare Trample Beast. Not going for the reach this time. Doesn't seem super relevant here, as it turns out. And Ian now has a decision to make as he's drawn Elder Gargaroth for the turn as well. Elder Gargaroth actually could get Ian into trouble if he plays it and then Pewter gets to steal it with the Akron War. Could get some action going there. But uh, I think that the a really appealing sequence of plays here is to just play Binding because that also gets you a land next turn, which means in two turns you know you can cast your ultimatum even if you haven't drawn uh, a land naturally. Yeah, you know, it feels like Ian is incentivized to be conservative here and not go for the highest upside play, and that means just casting Binding. Because he has the ultimatum waiting, and he knows that that's a, you know, that's a game winner. So there it is. Binding the Old Gods hits the battlefield, takes down Vivian. A land off the top of the library does mean that Kenrith the Return King could be on the menu here for Pyotr, though he has to decide what he wants to do. 16 life for Ian Burrell. Yeah, Kenrith has a 4-4 four -four that has uh, some abilities, is is reasonable. peter has got to be pretty unhappy about uh, taking that Elspeth's Nightmare now, looking at that ultimatum that could come down as early as this turn. Yeah, that's got to be tough. Could and will, as it turns out. Indeed, there's a land off the top there for Ian Burrell, and we're going to see Emergent Ultimatum go on the stack. That thing's resolving. And Ian could be stealing a match from Pyotr here with a deck that he's not even happy with. He went one and two with this deck yesterday and said that he felt like it doesn't line up against the metagame of the tournament well, which made him kind of regret making the choice. But boy, when you can pick up a win with it after going 3-0 in Historic, that is right where you want to be to start off the standard rounds. It, it, it is. I, I do understand the feeling that Ian has. I, you, you've seen me before, Marshall. You'll, you'll go. We'll go to a pro tour, and after like round two of constructed, you'll be like, "How's it going?" And I'm like, "My deck's not good. I can't win this tournament." So, it, yeah. you get this feeling, the sinking feeling in the pit of your stomach. But you know what? You registered the deck. You got the rounds to play. There's no rule that says Ian's going to lose, even if maybe he wishes his deck was a little bit better positioned. And he's going to go get away with this match, which actually, uh, you know, leaves him in a very good position in this tournament. Kyorabes' Sea God, Valky, and Alrun's Epiphany, one of the classic trios that you can choose off of Emergent Ultimatum. And uh, Pyotr, well, that kind of says it all. He's sitting there looking at the screen like none of these are good options. Yeah, I think that uh, Kyorabes, the Sea God, is ultimately going to be the hardest card to beat, but in, in reality, they're all equally hard to beat, as in you're not beating any combination of two of them. Right. right. I mean, Tabalt plus the Alrun's Epiphany here. To be fair, Alrun's Epiphany didn't make any birds thanks to that Karabek, it's but it's true. I think two turns of Tibalt, because you're about to take an extra turn here, it's going to be enough. And, oh, that second ultimatum, that's got to wow. that, that, that's gotta just, you know, that would break my spirit if I was Pyotr. I, I probably would have already conceded because... <laughs> yeah, uh, you know. So uh, we'll see if Pewter has a uh, ha has kind of the the ad uh, appetite to sit here and kind of let Ian just play with his food, play all the best cards out of his deck. Oh, I'm sure Ian will be thrilled uh, if Pewter lets him do this. The real question is, is how much can Pewter take at this point? Because this one looks like it's in the books. Nobody survives back to back emergent ultimatums, not without some extraordinarily weird scenarios here and uh, this is not one of them so ian burrell well on his way to a 2-0 victory over Pyotr victor zach and uh boy like i say he's just going to be thrilled to have picked up a, another win with his standard deck he only found one win with it yesterday 
really trying to distance himself from this middle pack. He's at five and four, so he's on the plus side of it. This would move him to six and four if he can finish things off here. <laughs> so instead of casting an ultimatum, Ian's going to go <laughs> ahead and use Tybalt to minus three on Kenrith and then cast the Kenrith. I, I, I like his style. Pretty rude. Pretty rude, Ian, bro. <laughs> There's a Winota. He also has a Crow in War. Well, a Crow in War on Kenrith can actually let you haste it and uh, threaten to kill. In fact, it does kill. That does kill Tybalt. I mean, th this this actually turns around a little bit here. That gets Tybalt off the battlefield? Oh, man. Because Kenrith not only gives haste, it also gives trample. Right. Oh, he had enough mana yeah. for the plus one, plus one counter, so. Clever. That, so that, that makes this will attack actually a be enough lot, to, yeah. yeah, less appealing. <laughs> yeah, that means that it would be a trade-off with Karavek and uh, Tabalt would survive. So Ian Burrell had his bases covered there with the ability to put the plus one, plus one counter on. Question is, does Piotr feel that this attack is still worth it? He's thinking about just sending the Kenrith? I think if you're going to send Kenrith, I, I do agree that the, the Beast should also yeah, kind of get, get into, because if, uh, if Karabek blocks the Beast, then Kenrith kills the Tybalt, and that's not likely what Ian Burrell is going to want to do. Right, he's going to let that Beast through if it attacks. So there we go. It looks like Piotr has uh, decided to attack with both creatures here at the end. And in they come. So Burrell has a pretty forced block here, just needs to trade off with this Kenrith and uh, keep his Tabalt alive at just one loyalty. But WoW has won a lot more than zero in this case because that can just lead to so much more advantage. He hits a Cultivate and a Shatter Skull Smashing. What does he have against that Emergent Ultimator? Does he have, no does he have nothing great to get <laughs> after the sideboard? No, he could still get Kiora Best the Sea God, Plus, like, another, if he's got a, the second Alruns Epiphany, if he didn't board one out, and... Uh, not. You can see yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> so, those two, plus maybe an Elder Gargaroth, uh, seems like that would that would also get the job done. He or sure, Vor Vorn Clex. Clex. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> also, of note, the Epiphany actually gets to make the birds this time. Oh, as we're chatting about records, uh, the the overlay has these players at 5-4, but I think Ian is, at, I believe, 6-3 and three coming into this round. Oh, so even better. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, I was, I was mentioning that, uh, that he could separate himself out from the field, but he's actually kind of already done that. This, this one win, in fact, puts him in range. He, he would need to string together back-to-backs to guarantee that finish but uh, still in good position here for a top 12 and if you think about it i mean top 12 is half the field so mm -hmm. it's it, it certainly you know doesn't mean you, you have to you, you you can get away with not winning any games and getting there every win is very hard to earn in this field but top 12 is also you don't have to go that much more than 50-50 to have a pretty good shot at it. That's right. Winota and an elite spellbinder in hand for Piotr. He's going to cast Winota. And it looks like he wants to spin the wheel here. It's going to cost him his beast. And he kind of misses. Yeah, you could you you can get an attacking Winota if you want, but not a, uh, not 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 something that's uh, particularly enticing. There we go. That's going to do it. Piotr Victor Zach steps away from the computer after conceding. He's seen enough of this one, and Ian Burrell picks up a 